The year is 2001, and we have just seen a rough cut of the film that you know as Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or Philosopher's Stone, if you're in England. And uh, we're here to fix it. Cue the intro. Hey everybody, welcome to the Mirror Movie Universe. My name is Dan, I'm one of the hosts of this show, and joining us today is Brian. Brian was here for Lord of the Rings, he's our resident fantasy expert. Brian, how are you? I'm great, yeah. I love that I'm the fantasy expert, considering there's only like two um, book series or a movie series um, in the entire fantasy genre that I really enjoy, but it happens to be Lord of the Rings, obviously, and Harry Potter, so here we are doing it. Two great choices, yeah. Now, before we get into it, I have to ask you the ultimate Harry Potter question. What house are you in? So so, so it, I almost feel like it's a little bit of a cliche because I'm definitely Gryffindor, but everybody thinks they're Gryffindor. Everybody thinks they're uh, Gryffindor. I, I know, but I am everybody. Gryffindor. Like, I'm not Slytherin, and I guess if I had, like, a secondary house, it might be Ravenclaw, but... um. See, here's what, like, you have to, here's what you have to remember, Brian, is you get sorted when you're 11. Now, I didn't my 11-year-old self was more Gryffindor than I am now. I didn't know you when you were 11. Yeah. Fair. But I know someone who does. Your uh, middle school sweetheart, who is your wife, and she describes 11-year-old you as, and I quote, such a douche. Pretty sure, <laughs> pretty sure that puts you right in Slytherin, sir. For life. That, that rings true for her. Everything about her, like... Totally sounds like her, you know. And, and I'm Hufflepuff, of course. So. That is, of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> terrible. You're just like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, but boy. That makes sense, yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're here to talk about Harry Potter <laughs> and the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, we're going to fix it. Now, now, that doesn't mean that we don't like the movie or anything like that. It's just a framing device to talk about the film, what we like, what we would maybe change about it. But before we do that, we're going to talk about what happens in the movie. Now, Brian is going to do a little run through of the film. Brian, what happens in the first Harry Potter movie? All right. So Harry Potter opens uh, with the Harry Potter as a baby getting delivered to his aunt and uncle's house and cousin's house, the Dursleys. Um, Hagrid sort of brings him in. He's met there by McGonagall and Dumbledore, uh, who we find out later are professors. One's the headmaster and one's a professor at Hogwarts. You know, these three people really care about Harry um, deep down in their being. Um, They drop him off at the Dursleys and they say he's better off that he doesn't get raised in the magical world, but he gets raised in the sort of non-magical muggle world. Um, and they leave him there. Um, the movie then jumps to when he is 10, almost 11. Um, he's been living with the Dursleys now for 10 years. They don't like him. They're very cruel. We find out much, much later. We'll go into why they are so cruel to him later on. But um, but they've raised him in a very cruel environment. They didn't give him a bedroom. He lived under the stairs. You know, they don't care about him. They, they don't give him toys. They don't give him presents. They don't celebrate his birthday. You know, the whole nine yards. Um, and on his 11th birthday, he gets his letter letting him know that he has been accepted to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Um, and he doesn't even know what that is. Um, he, Hagrid shows back up, very importantly, again, Hagrid steps back into his life on his 11th birthday to retrieve him and bring him to Hogwarts. Harry doesn't know that he's a wizard. Harry doesn't know that he's magical. Weird things have happened that, that, he can't explain, but he certainly has never come to the conclusion, oh, I must be a wizard. And Hagrid now tells him, you're a wizard. Hagrid, as he walks him through the magical world and he walks him through um, Diagon Alley, where he's met with magical stores and other magical people and all these, you know, great and wonderful things, um, Harry's still quite confused. Uh, and finally, he realizes that, um, as Hagrid like sp- explains to him, is that he um is the boy who lived so he goes to hogwarts uh he uh goes to the first dinner he gets sorted into gryffindor and he meets his two best friends he actually meets his two best friends on the train even before he's sorted but he's just sort of uh not really navigating anything yet uh and he meets his two best friends hermione and ron 
Um, very importantly to their story, Hermione is uh, from muggle background. She's raised also by non-magical parents. And Ron is from a pure blood magical family uh, raised entirely in magical world. So he doesn't really know anything about the muggle world, the regular world. He only knows the magical world and Ron and Hermione only know the muggle world. Um, so their sense of wonder, their sense of surprise is something that they constantly sort of go back to. It's it's um, the sort of setting that keeps on giving because they're constantly in wonder of this world throughout the entire series. Every Every new revelation, every new spell, every new thing is just met with this wonder by the other two and a kind of um, dismissiveness by Ron. Mm -hmm. And Ron's a little bit, um, I wouldn't call him an oaf, but he's certainly not an intellectual. You know, he's not uh, terribly interested in sort of academics. Um, uh, and that sort of gets drawn out also by this first movie, which I'll get into in a moment. So he now has his two friends. He's sorted in Gryffindor. He's met his sort of nemesis in Draco Malfoy, who's who's also a pureblood um magical boy from a pure blood family who's very pretentious and sort of condescending to most other to most other witches and wizards um and here he goes about sort of um his his time there at hogwarts in his first year as he's sort of discovering everything um but there's also he realized when he was first dying in alley there's this stone uh that hagrid picks up hagrid's on an errand for dumbledore and the stone is called the sorcerer's or philosopher's stone and the stone helps one live forever um and harry hasn't connected all these dots yet that, that gets drawn out but the person who killed his parents that's all he wants is to live forever so he's after this stone um he wants this stone so that he can he can come back to life he sort of went away but he wants to come back um and harry thinks that one of his other professors a professor snape um is doing is is trying to get the stone is trying to steal it so he's constantly suspicious of snape and he's constantly trying to figure out what's really going on and um and going you know on his on his uh little adventures about halfway through the movie harry uh it hits christmas time it sort of follows <laughs> a liturgical calendar in a weird sense um but it does hit christmas time and um harry doesn't want to go home so he stays at hogwarts and ron as a matter of fact stays as well and Harry receives this gift, a very important gift. He's given an invisibility cloak. Um, and it's with a note that says, this belonged to your dad. And every time throughout the movie, Harry discovers a little bit more about his parents, these parents he never got a chance to know. And that's really, and this is this really lays the groundwork for him. We'll get into this when we talk about what we like. But Harry longs to have family. Mm -hmm. And he finds that at Hogwarts. Um so he gets this little piece of information about his dad. He puts on the invisibility cloak and he actually wanders into this special part of the castle and he comes across a mirror. Um, and the mirror is very important because the mirror shows you as you discover. I mean, this is like played out in, in the plot of the movie, but the mirror shows you exactly what you want. Uh, Harry sees his parents, right? He sees his mom and dad on either side of him and they're, they're just sort of looking at him and smiling and and that's what Harry really desires. When he shows Ron this, Ron sees himself with uh, the Quidditch Cup and a bunch of glory and honors and all these things. Um, uh, when Dumbledore finds Harry in front of this mirror, you realize that like that's that's all Harry really wants. He just wants to have a family. Um, so anyways, we'll fast forward. Uh, they get into, um, they're trying to discover where the stone is. Hagrid sort of gives it away. Um, they think they're going to find Snape who gets it. Um it's it's buried in this it's like a dungeon that he, that you go down into. Ron, uh, Harry, and Hermione concoct this plan. They're going to go down. They're going to make the dog go to sleep, and they're going to get the stone. Um, they go down there. They get caught by something. Uh, the Devil's Snare is that right, Dan? The snare, correct. Yeah. So the Devil's Snare. It's like vines that sort of overgrow. Hermione solves the puzzle and and uh, saves them from the Devil's Snare. They move on. They fight this chess batch um where ron who's very good at chess sort of navigates the chess match he sacrifices himself in this moment he said you know it's not about me uh getting the stone it's not even about hermione it's about you harry you have to do this so they sacrifice themselves ron in particular sacrifices himself and hermione stays with him so that harry can move on harry goes in and he finds um the professor of the dark arts Dan, you against the dark arts somebody's gonna nail you for that oh yeah what did i say Dark arts. 
Oh, sorry. The defense of against the dark arts. Yeah. Uh, defense against dark arts teacher, um, Professor Quirrell. Um, so Professor Quirrell is there. He takes off. He wears this turban the whole time. He takes off the turban, and he realizes that Voldemort has sort of infused himself on the back of Professor Quirrell's head. So um, they have this big battle. Um, Harry touches Professor Quirrell, and he sort of disintegrates. Um, and that makes Voldemort sort of go back into his shell or, you know, go back into like, I don't know, the spiritual world or whatever. Um, and Harry wins. He survives. He got the stone back. He gives it to Professor Dumbledore and sort of saves the day. Um, and I think, did I, Dan, did I miss any major plot points of, uh, of Sorcerer's Stone? I mean, I'm sure that somebody's going to say that you left something out. The only thing is that at the end, Dumbledore gives out points like Drew Carey on whose line is it anyway. He's just like, 50 points to Gryffindor! 1,000 points! Good job! Yeah. So Gryffindor wins that year. Yeah. Wonderful. Harry also makes the Quidditch team, but that didn't seem like to sort of drive the plot forward, so I didn't include it. So, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> All right. Let me give you a chance to uh, to catch your breath and just talk about some of the things that I love about uh, the film. So... Um, first off, the first two films here are very similar. Um, they're directed by Chris Columbus. They have uh, the same cast with, with a couple little changes throughout. And it is uh, the, the music by John Williams. I have to call out the music. It is so good. When I think about uh, John Williams and everything he's done, you think about these big brassy marches. You know, you think about Indiana Jones you think about Star Wars, and you do get some of that here, especially when they enter the Great Hall. You get that dum 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 kind of thing. But that theme that he came up with, that that light, ethereal, magical, if I can use that word theme, that 12-note theme, has become so synonymous with Harry Potter. More yeah. so than the scar or or the story or anything else. I mean, if you hear that da 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 dum 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 dum, you know. You know that it's Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so good. And and he doesn't do the music for all the films, but that theme stays with all of those films. Absolutely love it. I, I, and I know that, you know, some people have said like, oh, it's, it's too similar to like Home Alone or some of the other movies he's done. I think that the score for this stands out perfectly for the, for all the, the, the first three films, which he does the, the score for absolutely beautiful job. Uh, I also want to give a big shout out to uh, Chris Columbus as the director for this. He does such a good job here. Uh, famously, they, they approached a lot of different directors for this. They, Steven Spielberg was one. And he turned it down. He said, there's no challenge in this. Anybody could do this. Anybody could make this movie and make a billion dollars. And I, I don't know think that. that's true. Spielberg, Spielberg had a shot at it. That's cool. Yeah. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think Chris Columbus was the perfect person for this he does a couple things really really well so first he made sure that the kids were comfortable on set he had worked with kids before he was really adamant about that he set up a school so that they could take classes on set when they weren't shooting um he wouldn't let the crew like cuss around the kids um he did a really good job to protect them as much as he could mm -hmm. uh the other thing that he does just he handles so perfectly is the dursleys in every film after this, um, not Chamber uh, of Secrets, which he also directed, but every one that's directed by somebody else, the Dursleys are, are, they swing wildly in other directions. They're too comical or they're almost dystopian the way that uh -huh. they kind of act and live and things. And I think that Chris Columbus nails it because it is a very abusive situation that Harry's in. And it is kind of funny, some of the things that happen. And he toes that line very, very well. And of course he does. This is the guy who did Home Alone. This is the guy who did Mrs. Doubtfire. Like, you want dysfunctional families, you get Chris Columbus. Like, <laughs> he does such a good job with it. Yeah. And and you talked about the Mirror of Era said, I love that. I think that that is handled with such beauty and depth. And, uh, and it might have been lost by a lesser director. And it shows really the the duality of of Harry and Ron's friendship because they each have what the other one wants, right? Ron wants fame and money and, and glory, which Harry has in spades. And all Harry wants is family. Oh. And that's really all Ron has. He's got, you know, six uh, brothers and sisters. He's got his mom and dad, this, this wonderful family. 
you even see that at Christmas time. And I'm glad that Chris Columbus does the Christmas stuff, which you called out when, when Harry gets his gift and he's so happy to have that ugly sweater. And Ron is just like, no ugly sweater, but it's so well done. Mm -hmm. And then my last, like, I, I want to call out some actors from each film as we go through these, because the, the cast stays largely the same throughout. And, and so I'll, I'll highlight a couple. Daniel Radcliffe is great as Harry Potter. He is yeah. perfect as this wondrous, like, introduction to the world. And we experience it through his eyes and his wonder and his joy. It's just beautiful to see. Yeah. He does such a great job here and through everything else. And I love um, Hagrid is so great. Like, there's nobody better as you're a wizard, Harry. Like, absolutely spot on. Uh, fun fact for you, Robin Williams really wanted to be Hagrid. Uh, he he like petitioned Chris Columbus. He'd known him before. He was like, hey, I really want to do this. But one of the stipulations from J.K. Rowling to do this was that they couldn't have any American actors. So, they uh, so I knew part of that because I knew that she at least one of the core three, Ron, Hermione and Harry to be British. But she wanted everyone to be British. Yeah. She was uh, adamant about that, that if it was wow. going to be made, it had to be British actors. Wow. So Robin Williams would have be been great. Like, he I know. Been, he would have been. Yeah. He would have. But, but at the same time, Hagrid is fantastic. Brian, yeah. what do you love about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Given that I love these stories, um, it's hard to, to nail down as a couple of things that I love the most. But I'll start with a big picture. What I think Chris Columbus did so well, and they get to to milk this over the next eight movies, is that he built the world. Yeah, and that's that's not easy to do. Like he, you, you have to like step in. You have to spend some time in the beginning of any major story, particularly in fantasy. But C.S. Lewis talks about this too. If you're going to like tell a space trilogy or any any world where it's set sort of not in the normal world, you have to build the rules of that world, whatever that is. Um, and he does such a great job spending time building the magical world. You're introduced to Diagon Alley. You're introduced to magical families. You're introduced to the, the prejudices that magical people have and to the, the way that spells work and a little bit of the way potions work and sort of how people get it. You get it when you, or it's sort of like, um, you, you might figure out you've done some weird things when you're younger, but when you're 11, that's sort of when you sort of come of age, so to speak, as a, as a, um, wizard or a witch. Um, he just set, sets the rules and he establishes that in this first movie, which then just bears fruit again over the rest of the series. Um, and he does such a fantastic job doing that. Um, so I think that's, that's the first and major thing because that really does, it gets the viewer into that same mindset that you want to spend more time in this world. You want to be here. You know, even, you know, I just finished watching the movies with my own kids and, um, and by the end of the last movie, I'm like, I want, I want them to do like a Peter Jackson. I need extended cuts. Like yes. I want to spend more time in this world. I just want more of it. Um, and you're sad that it's over. You're sad that, you know, Harry's story is complete. Um, so yeah, uh, he does a great job there. I think he does a really great job, like telling the story, like you mentioned through Harry's eyes and giving you the interior life of Harry. Uh -huh. You know that what he really wants, he doesn't go after fame. He doesn't care about fame. If anything, he's somewhat annoyed by it uh, or confused by it, uh, particularly in the first one. Um, but he doesn't want that. He wants family. And he finds that in Hogwarts. And you feel that for him and with him throughout the story. He finally has friends. He finally has people that care about him. He finally gets to spend time with people who aren't mean and cruel to him, who aren't abusive. Um and, and that's really powerful. And I think the audience really cares for Harry because Chris Columbus does such a great job making sure that that's central to his character, that he, he maintains that from the books, that the audience cares for Harry really, really deeply and cares for Ron and Hermione because their loyalty to Harry, because they are so deeply committed to him and loyal to him. Um, you care for them because Harry cares for them. You are literally like, I mean, as, as an audience member, you you experience the entire story through Harry's eyes. And so who Harry loves, you love. And who Harry is annoyed by, you're annoyed by. And who Harry hates, you also hate. 
Um, and that really goes to show how, how great of a job the director does as keeping that vision. He makes sure like Harry is the centerpiece and the audience sees the world through Harry. Mm -hmm. um, so I really, really love that. I love Ron and Hermione. Hermione, I could, I could go on and on. She is my favorite character in the entire Harry Potter world. Um, I just think she's brilliantly written. I think she's captivating. I think she's intelligent. I think I, I think Hermione, and because she's a muggle, she also has that sense of wonder and she's sort of annoyed by Ron and attracted to him also. Like not, not you know, in like a romantic way, but just like she's drawn to Ron and his sort of stupidity. Mm -hmm. um, like she's not... She's not pretentious about her own intelligence. And I just think, I think Hermione is excellent. I've always liked her as a character. I think Emma Watson does a great job yeah. being her character. Um, so, so that's another thing that I love. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, like the, the play of, of his relationship with professors. I love Professor McGonagall. I actually think, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think J.K. Rowling requested that um, Maggie, Maggie Smith. Maggie Smith, Maggie Smith play McGonagall. Like she wrote her with Maggie Smith in mind as this person. That's, um, I don't know if that's true, but I I would yeah. believe it. Yeah, um, because she is just excellent as Professor McGonagall. She is. Um, she is so good. And and in that grandmotherly, like she's strict, but she cares very uh -huh. much for Harry. It's it's a great relationship. Exactly. And I'm so glad that they included her in that opening scene. Because it means that, like, she's been with Harry from the beginning. Yeah. Like, she's cared about him somewhat on the outside or someone on the outskirts of Harry's life, right? She's not central to who he is, but she's been with him from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, that's really, I think that's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's so much to love here. But uh, but I think those are the things that I really, that, that capture my attention at first glance. I agree with all of them. I, I think that, yeah, you, you've hit the nail on the head. There's there's a lot to love here. It's a very faithful adaptation of an incredibly good book. But yep. there are some things that we have to fix because that's the whole premise one. of the show. <laughs> uh, so my fix is, uh, and this is just a, a little bit of a thing. It bothers me. It, it bothers me outside of, of Harry Potter. I don't like when someone is just all of a sudden good at a sport. OK, um, Harry is fantastic at Quidditch and they say they set it up in the film like, oh, you're good because your dad was good at Quidditch, which fine. Yes, everyone has raw talent, but you have to work at it to be good. That's what makes sports uh, fantastic is you see people put in the work and then they get the reward for it. And so I don't love that he's just amazing right off the bat. I know that they have like that little bit where Oliver Wood comes out and, and he's like, okay, this is the quaffle, this is the snitch, you know? And he's like showing him everything. That's really an introduction to the audience. What I want to do is extend that a little bit more and have him train, just a little training montage. That's it. You know, yeah. if Rocky can do it, Harry can too. Just a little training montage, show some bludgers flying at his head, show him like doing a dive, have Wood be like, no, do it again. That's it. Show me that show Harry like exhausted. And then you put in the piece where he sees that his dad was good at Quidditch because then it's not, he's good at Quidditch because his dad was it's he's driven to be good because right. of his dad to pursue mm -hmm. that connection with his dad. And then yeah. it, it makes that motivation come through a little bit more. And it just, you probably have some B roll of him like, on the broom thing with green screen, like it shouldn't be hard to throw in some stuff, but that's my fix. Just, a, yeah. it's just a little thing. Make him work at the sports a little more. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so, so mine, I, I have two fixes. As a matter of fact, oh. um, so, so the first one, so, so the first one was like after watching it now a couple of times and thinking like, what, what do I like? What sort of lands well? I'm always somewhat disappointed by the climax of the movie. Harry has this sort of big battle with Professor Quirrell. Professor Quirrell is about to kill him. You know, they're in this fiery room and whatever. But but it, it always lacked for me stakes. Like, I don't quite know who Voldemort is. And I don't really know who Professor Quirrell is, except for he's sort of like a bumbling coward. Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't. You, you never get the sense like Harry is really in danger here. 
And so what I what I wanted, or what I think I'd, I'd, if I was telling the story, I'd want them to go back in just one quick scene of Voldemort taking over Professor Quirrell's body. Like, you know, oh. whatever, however he got infused in the back of his, of his skull, giving me that background where Quirrell maybe is fighting against Voldemort and then sort of cowers in fear at the power of Voldemort or Voldemort sort of conniving and brooding and then sort of taking him over without him knowing, however it, it sort of played out. Give me that backstory so that then when Harry goes up against him, I'm genuinely scared. Like Harry's up, he's out of his element. He's up against a, a, a foe who I've known has been demonstrated to me as an audience member is really, really frightening. Yeah. Um, that Quirrell, Quirrell may not be, you know, a particularly daunting uh, enemy or, or protagonist, antagonist, antagonist. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but Voldemort is because you've established Voldemort. I mean, yeah, they had the scene where he like drinks the unicorn blood, but you're not really scared because he's just sort of sucking unicorn blood and then he goes away. Um, but this, like some scene that really establishes Voldemort here is your enemy. And you should be really, really scared of him. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that they established that here. They, I mean, they do a great job throughout the rest of the series. I'm not saying Voldemort's a bad villain at all. No, but it could have really borne more fruit if you established him as a really frightening figure right off the bat. Yeah. So um, that's that's my first case. And the second one is, um, I, I, let's say, somewhat more personal. Like, I, it's more opinion-based than it is, like, narrative-based. Um but I always, because I like Hermione so much, and because I think her character is so interesting, I always wanted her backstory. Mm. Like, there's so much. I mean, you get Harry, in, in one sense, the entire narrative of the story is learning Harry's backstory. As Harry sort of discovers, oh, my parents are from uh, wherever. Oh, my dad did this. Or, oh, you know, my mom, you know, was good at this. And, you know, you learn more and more about Harry's backstory throughout the story. And Ron, it's sort of interwoven throughout the entire narrative. Yeah. You, you meet his brothers, you meet his sister, you meet his parents, you meet his, his dad's job, you go to his house a thousand times. You know Ron's story. But we get very little of Hermione. Yeah. Like, like just almost nothing. And it doesn't, what little we do get comes way later, like movie six and movie seven. Yeah. We get these like tiny little introductions. But beyond that, we don't get anything. So I would have really liked some scene, and ideally in my mind, not not Hermione telling the story, but like a flashback yeah. of you know her, maybe Hermione getting her letter from Hogwarts and being confused about, and her parents being like, "What is this place? Or what is this thing?" Like, or yeah. you know, maybe it's Hermione um, when she was uh, like especially um, passionate about something, and something magical happens, and she's confused, but Hermione's smarter than the other two, so she's like. This means something mm -hmm. like I need to, I need to like file this away, so to speak, um, like something where we get a little bit of Hermione's history. Uh, yeah. And I think that would help us attach a little bit more to Hermione's character um, and get a little a, a greater sense of who she is and sort of what motivates her, because that we have to piece together over the course of the next several movies. So those are my two like major things. If I was going to go back and switch, I would have I would have put those two things in. And again, it's it's not um coincidental these are just additions yeah. like i like everything that's already here just give me a little bit more of what's already here yeah. because i love the story and the world so much i uh, i totally get you know what's funny is i almost my fix for this was almost more hermione too she is a great oh, yeah. character and i was gonna do the i wanted more as to why she became friends with harry and ron because even, even in the book it just has this line like oh and from that day on they were all friends and, and at the beginning, like Harry and Ron really bond on the train, but Hermione, not so much. So I wanted more from that. But mm -hmm. I guess, spoiler alert, uh, we're saving I'm saving that, not that exact thing, but I'm saving more Hermione as my fix for the Chamber of Secrets. So, you oh, have to, all right. uh, yeah, <laughs> you'll, you'll have to watch the next episode. But I, I love I love what you're doing with that. I think more Hermione is always fantastic. And I agree. Out of all the Defense Against the Dark Arts uh, teachers and 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 antagonist throughout the series. I think Quirrell is the weakest and the reveal. Oh, it wasn't Snape. It was actually Quirrell. Okay. But then you got Voldemort, but he's not that scary. So sure. I, I totally buy into that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. 
All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. So please uh, like it if you like it. Comment down below about what you would change about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone. Tell Brian everything that he got wrong in the summary. He loves that. Yep. <laughs> and please subscribe so that you can see Chamber of Secrets, which we will be doing next. All right. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. God loves you. And so do we.